Hello, and welcome to the Homesteading Academy, where homesteaders come to learn. I am Lisa, if this is your first time here, and my channel is Yogi Hollow Farm, and we've started this educational series to provide other homesteaders with education. For those of you who have been watching this series, please leave us a comment down below. Let us know how you think it is going. And also let us know some of the topics that you would like to see on the Homesteading Academy. Today, we are going to be talking Chickens 101 with Rich from the Old Swedes Farm. And if anyone who does know him knows that him and his wife, Holly, have a large number of chickens in Minnesota, and they are well known for their chicken videos and chicken advice videos and how to care for chickens. So I thought it would be really good to have them here with us today. And so Rich is actually here, excuse me, Rich is here, and he will be talking to us about Chickens 101. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Rich. And just an FYI, this is a pre-recorded session. And so Rich will be in the chat with us and you'll be able to ask him questions. So I'd like everybody to give a big warm welcome to Rich at the Old Swedes Farm. Hey. Welcome, Rich. Where's, where's that applause uh, button you got to hit? Uh <laughs> Here, wait, I do have it. Oh, jeez, I, I was kidding. Confetti can rain down and uh, applause. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I've loved the uh, the previous videos on the Academy. Uh, there's so many topics you've had that I know, or I thought I knew a little bit about it, and it showed me how little I knew on some of them when you bring the expert in. So it was good. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, it's been a really good series. We've gotten some really good feedback so far. And I ju it just made me uh, think about when we first started um, you know, Ryan had the history of working on a sheep farm, actually, and working on other farms as well as an adolescent and growing up in a rural area. So he was pretty familiar with it. But I grew up in Queens, New York and had not a clue. I don't, you know, no one taught us how to can. No one taught us any of that. Um, just gardening. My dad was an avid gardener. But, you know, it's one of those things that I thought back, wow, we've really learned a lot in the past few years. And so just thought it was a great way to share and hopefully help people prevent mistakes yep. and have things go smoothly. Well, don't do the same mistakes we've made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, it makes me think of, we did our uh, pig pens. We did uh, our pig pen three or four different times. And I remembered every time I did a video, I was like, here we are, number three, number four, <laughs> because we we realized we could expand. It's good to see the evolution though. Uh, and the, the, yeah. the changes you make and we've done the same thing. So with, with chickens and, and how we care for them and what we do, the improvements from us when we started to now are gigantic leaps. So it's fun. Go Absolutely. I, I just, uh, we've been, you know, on our farm, uh, on our little homestead here, we've got a little over three acres. We've been here almost three years now. And like you said, I grew up in the suburbs. Holly grew up in a tiny town in northern Minnesota. Um, we both were exposed to gardening. But as far as animals, as far, as far as chickens, nothing. You know, we went to the store and got the chicken eggs. And they were all white. And, you know, they came from somewhere and we ate them. That, that was it. So as we were thinking about getting a homestead, we made a list of what we really wanted. Um, and then once we got here, what we needed and, you know, what could we really accomplish? Gardening obviously was easy. And we thought, you know what, chickens, we can do that. We can do the chickens. And we had all winter to think about it. So that was good for us to not be able to jump in. Sometimes you jump in and you get into things over your head. We really thought through what we could do. Pigs are on the back burner. Some other things are on the back burner, but chickens we could accomplish. So um, COVID hit then because uh, we moved in three years ago. COVID hits. And so it's us two on the farm. OK, well, what can we do? And that's when we did get chickens. In our first year, we uh, bought 20, is there 20 or 25 of them, uh, Rhode Island Reds and uh, Barred Plymouth Rocks. And I had my, my office and we got a large tub 
uh, one of those cattle troughs, put some shavings in them. The girls showed up. We got the right food or what we were told was the right food, got the heat lamp, and we started off. And it's probably like a lot of people. You just jump in. Chickens are a great gateway animal, you know, to start with. But we then, for our first year, we had 20 chickens and uh, raised them and learned and had a ball. You know, COVID, you needed some sort of distraction. And our distraction was while the chicks were growing um, in there for the first month or so, we were out building. We got them in April and we started building our coop. Uh, and we have an outdoor coop that we built. The coop itself is within a run. Um, we tried to come up with something. I had a, a vision in my head of what I wanted. And the coop is nothing more than eight, eight four by eight sheets of plywood. Uh, so it's four feet tall, eight by eight. The bottom is two sheets of plywood, plywood on each side, eight feet, eight feet, then the roof. And it's within then a larger run, which is 14 by 18. So, um, we built it with two by fours and metal fabric, something to protect them. I, I really wanted to build something that was going to last for years and years. I hate building something on the cheap and then having to next year build something on the cheap and the next year mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. build it once. So we've got a 14 by 18 run. And within that is a, an eight by eight uh, coop where they go at night. Um, now we're blessed being out in corn country. Um, we've got fields on three sides of us and a road out front, but our three acres is fully open to the cornfield and all. And we let our girls free range. So at, you know, in the morning, the girls get up, they do their feeding, open the door, they head out and spend the day out running around. They'll come back for a little food if they can't find uh, bugs and such. And then at night they walk back in and we lock the door. They go up in the coop and sleep and we repeat it the next day. So it's just a, it's worked out really well for us. Um, but then, you know, I don't know if, if, if the viewers watching this are total beginners, get ready because you want chickens, you get 20. And then the next year, Hey honey, how about, uh, how about a few more? That was fun. And so you get more chicken math. So right now we have 79 chickens. Awesome. Uh, we've had a total of 100 uh, over the over the past three years. Uh, we bought 40 this year and we're going to probably have 60. Uh, we're, we're looking to get rid of some of the older ones who are slowing down a little bit. Um, we just feel like we can only carry about 60 through the winter. Um, Besides our outdoor coop, we've got a larger pole barn where they have access to about a, oh, a 40 by 40 foot area or 35 by something like that. It's a good area, plenty of roosting space, but I don't think I could put 79 in there and keep them happy. Um, part of our goal, they, they have free reign of the farm uh, year round. Uh, every day we'll open it up, even if it's 20 below. They don't like going out at 20 below, but they have free range and we really love our chickens. We want them to live a great life. Uh, if they're out enjoying things, they're laying happy eggs. So um, during the winter, they're out of the small coop and they're into the pole barn. So um, we've had a lot of a lot of good things. Um, and I don't know where you want me to start. If you want me to start with, you know, little chicks and, and such or. Well, actually, yes. Um, so why don't you start at, you know, um, care in the brooder and then we'll move on to, you know, transitioning as they go up, you know, and I think some of the questions people might have are related to, um, you know, how many chickens can I house? You know, um, I know for myself, we have a 10 by 10 coop and I've had 26 in there and it's worked out amazing. I'm going to have 29 in there this year, and I think I'm a little at my top. However, I think because they free range, they're going to be great because the way mine is set up is I have an indoor run as well as an outdoor run. And believe it or not, except for the really, really cold days, I can leave that coop open and they love being outside on the outside roofs. Yep. Unless it is you know, snowing or raining hard, they don't mind being outside. And um, yep. that's one thing I am located in 
South Central Minnesota, I can mm -hmm. have everything from 100 degrees to minus 20 or so with a big wind. Um, Within bought, three days. Yep. <laughs> yeah, possibly. We have, uh, we bought chickens that are, that would be the first thing I would tell beginner owners. Look at what chickens are good for your area. Um, we did not get any of these little skinny, um, tiny breeds or the, the ones that don't have a lot of feathers. It's going to be 20, 25 below for a while here in Minnesota. We got the ones with the big fluffy bums and a lot of feathers. And when they sit on that roost at night, um, they're warm. They huddle together. There's no need for heating here if you choose the right breeds. Um, our biggest concern is during the summer, keeping them cool, providing enough mm -hmm. shade areas, providing enough water, providing enough, you know, bring cold treats out. But that's our big concern. So um, the number one thing, if you're looking at getting chickens, look at what is appropriate for your area um, and what breeds will work. And for us, it was just cold, cold management. And our girls, Minnesota, you should never have to have a heater or in the upper Midwest, I don't believe you should have to have a heater in your uh, in your coop. Uh, if you have that and your girls are dependent on your heat, wait for the power to go out and they don't know how to keep themselves warm. You're going to have a flock that is decimated with a power outage. So, um, but yeah, back to I, I, I just go ahead. I just want to say one thing. Um, because I do have personal experience with that. So that I just want to insert one little thing. I am a, I am firmly a believer in that. Like you said, I do not believe in any supplemental heat in the coop because they can't handle it. It's also an extreme fire danger, even if it's a, any kind of heating element, not just a heat lamp. Um, and I will say this, there was one time that I put heat in my coop and that was because we had an extended week or so of negative 30 wind chill and my girls were lethargic. But I always said to folks, I put that heater. It was a, I call it a bar. We call it barn heaters because it's the kind that tip over. Yep. They have a fan on it. So if it tips over, it shuts off. I put it on a metal table in the middle of the coop and I was paranoid for 24 hours. But after the paranoia, uh, my girls look normal again, and I shut it back off. And mind you, that heat didn't bring it up to 80. That heat put it up to about 10 degrees. Yep. And the girls were happy, and they were able to adjust again. I think it just wore on them. But that's a really great point, what you said about heating. So thank you. And, and we've done some other things, too. Uh, I wouldn't say intentional, but uh, kind of accidental excellence. Um, we go with the deep litter method out in our pole barn during the winter. We start adding straw to the ground just to pick up their droppings in October. And I don't clean it out. I let them drop. Uh, after a couple of weeks, I'll bring in another bale of hay and break it into four or five pieces, you know, chunks of hay. And the girls love it. They're scratching around mm -hmm. and they're spreading it everywhere. It's entertainment for them but they're adding another layer on top of their droppings. And then they drop for another week or so, bring in another bale. And it's just a constant. And by spring, I've got about six or eight inches of straw and droppings in there. But during the winter, that combination of manure and the carbon, it starts composting. And I shot a video last year. I, I went in there, it was 20 below or 15 below, put the, the heat gun down, it was 36 on the ground because that compost was given off heat. So there are ways to heat without throwing a heater in there. But I just have girls that they can handle it. They really can. They fluff up, they get that layer of air in their feathers and they're perfect. So long, long story, get your, get your <laughs> well, girls that are appropriate. People don't realize, people don't realize that, you know, chickens are extremely hardy extremely yep. hardy if you buy the right breeds. So don't buy for pretty, don't buy for anything else. The biggest thing you could do is buy for your zone, yep. buy for your region and your weather. Cold tolerance is huge for me. I mean, I look at out, uh, out my office window uh, in the winter, the little chickadees, I mean, those tiny little chickadees out there on the branch and they're sitting there fluffed up 
and it's 25 or so below and they're outside. My chickens are nothing more than a big, big version of that chickadee. They got the same down, the same feathers, the same body mass, fluff the feathers, sit on the, the roost the right way, and they're good. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Um, we started out, like I said, with 20, it was either 20 or 25. I can't remember. I'm sorry. The past three years have been a blur with my girls. Um, got one of those large uh, metal troughs, and that was perfect. Uh, for that, for those 20 or 25 girls, had one heat lamp in there and one end had uh, water, uh, a couple of waters and a couple of uh, long little trough with uh, food in it and let them go. We didn't know what we were doing, but we learned, had read and, and we went at it. Pine shavings down below, you know, a couple inches of that. The dip their beak, we got them at the store. We uh, don't raise our own, uh, we don't hatch our own eggs. We mm -hmm. order from Hoover's Hatchery down in Iowa. They've been great. They ship They're it awesome. same day to a, a local feed store where we pick up our food. Store calls us. Hey, they're in. And we're, you know, we're like everybody. You're so excited to get your new chicks. We're in there. We're out there in 10 minutes. So um, we went and picked them up. They come in a little box, bring them in, dip their beak in the water, let them go. Then they're kind of on their own. You know, you have to watch for pasty butt and a couple little things just to make sure they're all doing good talk to them every day make sure they know who you are um they respond it's fun to play with them and as they're getting bigger they're the cutest little things they stayed in my office for maybe a month and we got them in april by may it was warm enough we made a makeshift structure in the pole barn just to keep them out of the elements while we're building our uh, our coop um and i knew to get them out of my office at about a month because they were flying up to the top they were ready to get out and i didn't want to every now and then one would get out in the middle of the night you'd hear it cheap 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 cheep. i gotta come down find where it, it's run off to and bring it back so it was time to get it out of that structure into something bigger um during that first month though they're imprinting on you you're learning a little bit about them and their, their schedule. They run, run, run till they drop. They literally sometimes just drop right where they're standing and they're out <laughs> sleeping. Um, yeah. You've been through that cute phase. And after that, then they are inquisitive. They want to get <laughs> yeah. out and see the world and explore, except for, you know, you bring one out, oh, let's check and see what she would do on grass. Oh, they're <laughs> uncomfortable. That first time you set them in the grass, they won't move. They don't know where to, what to do. Um, but it's funny you mentioned that because la last night we we have three coops now, and we're real excited because it's given us the opportunity for when we hatch turkeys next year. But we had chickens, and we were moving them. And last night we moved the hatchlings from the small little grow out coop to the larger coop. And, you know, it was funny, it's dark. So we pick them up, we put them in the coop. And even at that age, they went like this. <laughs> yep. They're, if you can grab them at night, good time to move them. We, we did that. And we just needed our little staging area. Um, and our first batch of girls actually stayed in the outdoor coop for the first winter. Um, and then we realized, you know, it's just uh, mesh, uh, metal fabric around the entire run. And during a good blizzard, snow's blowing in there and it's drifting and mm -hmm. um, they don't particularly like being in the wind. You know, they'll try to find a place. So they were just huddling in the coop. And that's why we built out the pole barn itself, put a big uh, coop inside there. We've got two large... Um, roosts roost areas that we've built with two by fours uh at different heights so you know obviously the higher you are in the pecking order the higher you are in the roost um but there's some great places to sleep but that first winter they literally were outside um in the elements they did fine there were a couple days where we did have some snow and wind and they huddled together um we check on them every day we're very active with our birds um i would say if you're going to be a chicken owner don't be an absentee owner, you know, and leave them for days at a time. You've got to change their water. You've got to, you know, in my book, food, water are, you know, you for sure. 
you've got to provide them some shelter and you've got to provide them protection. Um, mm -hmm. We've got that metal fabric all the way around. It is like Fort Knox. Uh, we've had that coop there and we've had girls in the outdoor coop for three years now. We have never had a predator get in. I've seen where they've tried to scratch under. We've got some metal fabric buried under. There's no way they're getting into that. Um, mm -hmm. If that was just chicken wire or screen or something, yeah, that might keep the wind out or the rain out. It's not going to keep a raccoon out. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very um, protective of my girls. They provide, uh, we've got a lot of customers. We, we have all our girls because they lay a lot of eggs. They, they add some mm -hmm. um, increase in our, our value of life out here on the farm. We get great eggs, but we have a lot of customers who love our eggs. And that's kind of why we have 79 of them. They give us many dozen eggs every day and our customers line up as fast as they can lay them uh, yeah. to buy them. So I don't have 79 chickens because I like having them run around. If I was <laughs> having them run around, if it was just me and Holly, I'd probably have like five um, just to have those run around. It is so nice to have them around. We've got over an acre of woods. They free range out there three years. I had one friend who came over and had a wood tick in three years. I still think she brought it over. So um, <laughs> but we've never had a wood tick on us. I've got grandkids. I never have to worry about them in the in the woods. Um, those girls clean up everything. Uh, I bet they do. I bet. They're really good at that, too. They, they're awesome. And, and right now is no matter where you move on the farm, there are crickets running around. It is like a constant protein source for them. <laughs> Um, their food usage over the past two or three weeks has gone way down because they are just absolutely decimating that uh, cricket population out there. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. And they do so that talk from, about. Oh, sorry, Rich, go ahead. They do that from a young age. Uh, I, it is interesting to watch. You know, the old girls uh, are, are bigs. I call them the bigs and the littles. Uh, are like this year. We've got girls from previous years are bigs. And they, they sleep in the pole barn. Our littles that we uh, hatched and uh, or got as day old chicks, um, they've been out in the smaller coop. At at some point, you know, we had them fenced off and separated from each other. Just the bigs and littles wouldn't get along. They the littles would get pecked on something fierce if we combined them right away. At about two months, two and a half months, we can let the flock got rid of the fence and let them free range during the day together. They have now become one big flock. Uh, it's taken about a month to really, they sit right next to each other. They dust bathe next to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they, have, they have become a flock. But at night, the bigs go into the pole barn. So it starts getting towards dusk and the littles head to their coop. It is funny. Our next thing's going to be in about a month to get them ready for winter. Going to have to go in at night, grab the littles, bring them out to the big girl, out to the pole barn and let them roost there for a couple of nights. Then they'll get it that that's where they need to sleep. And that's when the pecking order, that'll be the, some interesting. Yeah. The it is. It's funny. I know whenever we combine a flock, um, you know, it's funny because it's always um, the new flock huddled in the corner and then the bigger flock going around. And then every time the newer flock goes to one end, the bigger flock follows the, the newer one runs the other way. So <laughs> ours, it's, are, it's, ours are doing a really good job of integrating our girls, our, our newer girls, our littles. Um, I, I believe it might be just the breeds we got. They're a little taller in stature but they're actually yeah. going into the pole barn to lay eggs. Now they're actually going into, nice. Um, into the same boxes where the bigs are laying and nice. taking their turn or sometimes getting in front of a big to lay an egg, which I haven't seen any real major squabbles, but it surprised the heck out of me. Um, so they're, they're already used They know what, where they're going to be laying all winter, which is really good. A uh, nice step forward. We're about four months in with the littles and just about all the breeds. There's one breed that's not laying yet. They usually wait till 18 weeks. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it's an interesting process and you kind of go, you know, we had those the first year, not knowing anything. We've got them. They're a month old. We move them outside. Then we move them into the, the big, the coop. Um, once it's constructed, 
feed them, let them run around, watch them, you know, this and that. Then all of a sudden at four months, boom, we had our first egg. And then the excitement starts, you know, where are they laying? We get them nesting boxes, get them all set. They were actually laying on our deck. I, I think that first year they associated Holly and me with eggs uh, or something. They would put it right on the mat, the welcome mat at our back door uh, or on the yeah. deck. And we'd walk out and, oh, we got an egg. So then after about a week, they got it, that they needed to be in the laying boxes. We put some fake eggs and they put two and two together pretty quick. So, yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun to have around and they and they do learn pretty quickly. I will they say do. that. They um, do. We've got the, yeah. we open up the same nesting boxes for our group. You know, we've got 40 littles this year and they're all coming into lay or have in the past couple of weeks. So, you know, I open the nesting box from the back and look in and now instead of three eggs, I've got like 22 of these little mini eggs. Um, yesterday, I think we did have 22 little mini eggs in there and they're just piled in there. Um, so it's fun. It's a, it's when they start laying, it's just fun to, I don't know, see them that they've become big girls now. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's really good. So talk about, so talk about you. So you talked about your infrastructure, you've got the coop, you've got the pole barn. Um, you talked about deep litter. Um, and so deep litter effectively for folks who don't know what deep litter is, is, is composting right in the coop. It's building yep. up the bedding um, over a long period of time in the winter. Some people do it year round. I used to do it as we um, increased our birds. We have not done it as much. Um, and so what kind of bedding do you use in the summer? I think that would be helpful for folks. You know, know. Uh, what we use is in the, in the coop itself, in the for the littles right now the littles go into roost at night in that smaller coop the there's a 18 by 14 run and within that it's an eight foot by eight foot coop it's built up off the ground within the larger structure I, if you go out to the old swedes farm i've got a video on it so you can see what i'm talking about i've got a linoleum floor three roosts up above i bring every every two weeks or so a bale of wood shavings, break it open, put it in there, clean out the old stuff first that's been dropped on, put that in the compost pile in the garden, put fresh bedding down, so wood shavings. In the pole barn, since that is, you know, 40 by 40, there's no way I could put pine shavings down. I'd be, that'd be the million dollar money loser. Yeah. Um, so I do the same year round, bring straw in there and we're coming up on October. I'll clean out the summer straw and droppings um, and put that into the compost pile and then start the deep litter method for the winter. Um, straw is just, you know, a few bucks a, a bale. The girls love it to spread it around during the winter or I'm sorry, during the summer, I don't use much out in the pole barn, um, mm -hmm. 40 by 40. The girls are outside most of the day. They're dropping out. Uh, they're putting those little nitrogen bombs out in my lawn and out in the woods and all around, um, so that's the nice thing. You do use a lot less bedding, whatever it is, um, during the summer, at least during the summer here. Um, I, and I know the best is to use sand. And I'm not talking about, you know, for what do you use for your base? Uh, not play sand, beach sand, kids right. play sand. There is a rougher uh, cut sand that you usually will get at a quarry um, that is great. It's something that uh, play sand if the girls are in there they, they're going to peck at that because they want something in their gizzard to help uh, grind up that food if you give them play sand they can get an impacted crop um which is a i guess i've never had it but a, a hard thing to dislodge mm -hmm. um and can be dangerous mm -hmm. but that other sand is a very rough cut granite the uh, more sharp edges they get that at bigger pebbles they'll get it in there it'll grind up and then pass on with the bird uh, when they drop um, yeah, a lot of a lot of folks um, will do that because what they'll do is underneath their roosts, they will build a platform and put sand. Yeah. So that way they can scoop out the sand and keep it clean. I know that's on our agenda to do just because the more birds you get, the more dropping manure you have. Yep. And so we we are planning on that because we usually clean out our coop once a month. Um 
and in the summer just to prevent diseases because the more birds you have the more you got to keep the keep things clean so i know that um someone had suggested where you put a platform under all the roosts and then you can put a, a nice layer of sand and it's really a great way of reducing your bedding use um because it's collecting the dirtiest part of the coop what do you put in your nesting boxes well the, the one thing let me just uh, that that platform mm-hmm. i've seen a few people who have you know they've got the roosting bar and then they've got a platform underneath to catch it and then that's sitting above the floor what happens in reality when i look at what is going mm-hmm. on in those coops the mm-hmm. girls are saying well here's a platform i'm going to jump up there and i'm going to roost there and i'm going to maybe even lay eggs there uh, because it's a platform. So yes, it is catching the droppings from above, mm-hmm. but there's also birds sleeping there. So the ones above are yeah. dropping on the birds below. Uh, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not sold on that, that shelf method. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the idea of sand. I just don't, I've got such a big area. Um, it hasn't worked for me. I like the wood shavings, economical, love the straw yeah. on a big area, economical for me. Um, just think about what's below if you want to build something and then what will happen. Cause I'm just mm-hmm. seeing where girls want to roost up there as well. And they're getting dropped on and that's not, that's not thing. Or they're sitting on someone else's poop. Yep. And then, you know, if there's mites and such in there, their, their bottoms mm-hmm. in contact with that all night and there's a chance of issues. Um, absolutely. Think- absolutely. I mean, that's, a, that's why a lot of people stagger the roost because you have to put them a certain spacing apart. That's what we do. And I don't yep. remember it off. Yeah. Staggered because you don't want them pooping on each other. Staggered it height, gets disgusting. Uh, let, let the, let the, the pecking order play out, but uh, it's staggered. Um, one thing I would say just it, when you get chicks and you're starting out with chickens, it's cute. They're little tiny, tiny poops. They're easy to get rid of. <laughs> When they get bigger, <laughs> poops are bigger, and they drop about 10 times a day. And, and about three or four of those are during the night. So you know, under your roost, get ready. It's going to collect a lot of droppings. Okay. We put straw down there. They drop on, put more straw, clean that out several times in the summer. It's great. It's great fertilizer for your compost pile. Let it start a pile this year. By next year, it's going to be really good stuff for your garden. Um, yep. But they're going to give you a lot of it. <laughs> 10 times a yeah. day, means, you know, I've got 70, 79 birds, 790 droppings per day. <laughs> and most of them are out in the yard, in the forest. Uh, they're around. Um, and, but that's a lot of when when they're in the pole barn during the winter, you know, and you I want to get down to like 60 birds for the winter. Well, that's still 600 times. They're probably going to drop per day in a Minnesota winter in the pole barn. That's where the deep litter method really works well. Um, they had a lot of nitrogen. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So on. talk nesting boxes and then we'll go into feeding them. Nesting boxes. We've got a couple different things in the original coop that I built outside the smaller coop where the littles are. Um, while they're growing, um, I have where the nesting boxes are. Again, you can check out my video if you want. Um, but there's four nesting boxes and while they're growing, I have a board over that. It's screwed in. They can't even see the nesting boxes till they get about ready to lay. Um, and I keep it up until that someone drops that first egg or I really know they're going to lay. I can tell what their, their comb and waddle, how they're acting, that they're getting ready to lay. Then I'll take that board off. Um, it is exterior to the coop so I can access it from the outside. And it's just a, a four foot by one foot by one foot area. And within that, I've just bought four of those little plywood nesting boxes that you can get at most feed stores. They, it's kind of like a, an L-shaped with a bottom and a little thing to grab onto. Got four of those in there, just sitting right next to each other. I put straw in there, make a little hollow. They, they make a better hollow once it's there. <laughs> and I put a fake ceramic egg in there. Once that board is gone, the girls are getting of age or are right there and they look, oh, that's an egg. Once they drop one, they know what an egg is and they put two and two together. That's where the eggs go. So I use ceramic eggs. People sometimes will put golf balls in there, but very simple uh, construction. Uh, Those little boxes you can buy Mm -hmm. for 15 bucks at the store. We've got four of them in there, straw in them. 
out in the pole barn, I'm using plastic uh, plastic boxes that we bought at uh, Fleet Farm, a local store here uh, that's in our area. And I've got 16 of those in various spots uh, in groupings around the base of the pole barn. Um, and so every day they, you know, those are filled with, uh, with hay, or I'm sorry, with straw. They've got a fake egg in them as well. The plastic ones for me are just because they're using that year round. The littles are only using it part of the year. So that I keep the wood one, but those plastic ones are great. I'm getting ready, scoop them out, clean them out with uh, uh, a rag and bleach water, really scour them down. They're plastic. They hold up well. Put some new straw in there, put that fake egg back in there once it's clean, and I'm good to go for another couple of months. Um, I just like those permanent boxes. Um, I want to, again, buy something that I know is going to last. Uh, I, I see those things lasting 10 plus years. They've been using them a couple of years now, and I don't think they've made a, they've gotten dusty, and that's it. So, it's true. They get dusty because I know one of the things that I, that we purchased for ours was we built a frame out of some wood that we had. And then what we ended up doing was using um, dish basins. And so our dish basins have a, they have a board in front of them to keep them in there. Yep. And what we liked about it was in the winter time when it is freezing outside and I can't wash them outside and three, three chickens decide to go in and break an egg. Oh, yeah. I can pull that entire basin, bring it in the house, throw it in the utility sink and sanitize it yep. and then put new bedding in it and dry it. And I don't have to worry about doing that outside. But in the summer, it's awful convenient also. But they just get dusty. And I use straw for my nesting boxes as well, because I've learned that straw is much better than hay. Hay is awful. I've found. Hay's got um, seeds in it. Uh, hay's got a lot of seeds in it. And so the girls want to go in there and they think that's a feeding area. And I don't want them in there feeding because then they're dropping. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in full agreement. I don't use wood shavings in there either because the girls will eat some of the wood shavings uh, if they get small enough. And I, again, I don't want them feeding in the the nesting box. So you're yeah. you're dead on with straw. And and gang, if you're watching this, the girls are gonna there's gonna be a weak egg or they're gonna fight over something and step on it. You're gonna have a broken egg, and then it is sticky. It's nasty get something that you can clean out with some bleach and water and start anew um make sure you put some every now and then i'll put some uh diatomaceous earth in there just a little bit just as they're sitting there uh, it rubs up into their feathers mm -hmm. and helps if there's any mites or things um helps prevent that um we spent the money on those plastic ones you can build anything i've seen so mm -hmm. many creative uses just make sure it's functional. Some people want to make it all cutesy wootsy. You know, we'll put these buckets and this and that and do this. The, the purpose is to give them a safe, easy place to lay an egg. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so talk a little bit about, um, about feeding your girls and, you know, the essentials that they need as well as any health issues. I want to make sure we have time for, for those two topics. Yeah. Food and water are important. Um, clean food and water. Um, get waterers that, you know, you can clean. We, all of our waterers are plastic. Um, I found it's easier to clean those. I've seen other places that use metal and it seems like over time they rust. And so in the water, the water gets really murky with the rust and stuff. And I just didn't like that. Maybe girls will, you know, I'll have a, a little container of perfectly clean tap water and they go right next door to the puddle from the rain that someone else just pooped in and they'll drink out of that. So don't think your water has to be absolutely sanitary all the time, but the more you can, the better. I get our girls a day old and we get them, um, I can't think of it. it Coctosis, or I can't think of the, the right word. Coccidiosis. There you go. Um, we have them where they've been immunized for that. That's the only thing I get. And then when they're young, I get medicated feed. I don't want them having to deal with what they're getting into. They're drinking water that's been pooped in. They're cleaning up and scratching and getting bits of 
manure inside them, I want to eliminate that. So I, I go with a medicated feed as young. We go with the Purina band, brand. I'm sure there are so many brands out there. Our store mm -hmm. carries Purina. We've used that Purina medicated till they're about 16 weeks old. Mm -hmm. As they're getting towards laying, I bring them over to layer feed. Again, a Purina product just because that's what's available. And if I've got a leftover bag, I go like a 50-50 mix and then wean them out of the, the baby stuff. Mm. They're on big girl feed. They're ready to lay. It's got more calcium for their eggs. That's their main food. And I've got different feeders. Um, I have some big garbage cans with four openings uh, made of PVC that we fill. And then I can fill those and let them be. I can be gone for 10 days on vacation if I want. And the girls can still stick their head there and feed. They pick mm -hmm. on up, pick up on how to feed really quick. For waterers, I use uh, plastic, like I said, just the, I think they're two gallon or three gallon tall, and then they've got the, the base, the red base. Um, you do have to fill those every day or so. Um, I'd love to find a big, big version of that. Um, but they're also the ones that I get are heated. Out in the pole barn, obviously we're below zero water you've got to make sure if you're in a cold climate that the water doesn't freeze they need water even in the winter uh good clean not heated but above freezing water so i've got extension cords or power brought underneath uh, the ground to where their feeding station is and then there's two waters that are uh, plugged in and heated all winter um that's what i that's, that's good important. and then during the summer during the summer um, we've got two basins. They're just the basin that you put a big flower pot on to keep the water from getting on the floor. They're about so deep and, you know, a couple feet wide. We keep one in one part of the yard and one in another. And every day we bring out two gallons of water to each, fill them up. And the girls have outside water then while they're free ranging. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, they are truly free ranging. There's no leashes on them, no fences. They're picking bugs and grass and when the guy knocks his cornfield down, they'll be out finding every kernel that he accidentally <laughs> dropped out there. Um, they're, they have caught mice. They've uh, caught a frog the other day. Um, they eat a lot of stuff. Um, oh. And it can also get That's awesome. Cold. Yeah. Uh, as far as, you know, protection and stuff, I don't, I'm around a lot. I work from home. And so I'm here to keep an eye on them. If I hear something, someone squawk, you know, the, the squawk of hey everybody danger danger i go outside and just check things out and scare the hawk away or whatever um yeah i'm getting into protection versus food and water just give them good clean water give them a good place to consistently eat and consistent water and you're in a, you're in a good spot and they're so easy to care for even if you have 79 of them right yep. they're so easy to care for because really it takes a few minutes in the morning, a few minutes at night, checking water and feed and refreshing yeah. water and locking them up at night. And, you know, I think the biggest thing is keeping things clean. But even with 79, which can sound like a lot of chickens, right? And it is. Yeah. But it's really not a lot of work if you're maintaining it on a regular basis, just like the waters. What a lot of people don't realize is they rinse them instead of wash them. But if you wash them, that cuts down a huge amount of bacteria and a huge amount of exposure to diseases for them. We rinse so, them out all the time. You know, every day, you know, there's stuff that gets into the water. So we spray them out, fill them. Uh, and then every three weeks or so, they get a good wash down bleach water heavily mm -hmm. rinsed um, and then they're back in the game. So it's just those things. Cleanliness is your number one thing from day one. You've got to keep them clean. Um, they're still going to get into stuff. They're still going to get, you know, the chance of uh, whether it's a mite or a raccoon or whatever, there's still going to be threats to them. You try to eliminate uh, some of the issues, flies and such, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know we've had the, those issues. So, I think we all have, you know, I mean, that's a huge thing. So talk, talk about um, health issues slash predators, whichever you feel comfortable with talking oh, about. I can talk about both. Uh, over our three plus years, 
we've had probably one of everything. Um, if, if you told me earlier this summer, if you told me when I started uh, getting chickens that I would be cleaning a wound that was full of maggots, I would have said, what? How did that happen? You know, we've had it. Um, a girl had a little open wound and a fly must have laid eggs on it. And it just opened it. She eventually passed away from that. We, we couldn't catch it quick enough. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say cleanliness is important. Keeping your, there's going to be poop everywhere. Cleaning it off, scraping it off roosts, cleaning the roosts, uh, all the areas that they're going to come in contact with. Cleanliness is your number one thing. They're still going to find ways to get into stuff. Um, and so checking your girls when you're out with them, I'm, we're out with them every day. We're saying hi to them. We're rubbing them. We're at the same time, you know, as you're rubbing them, you're kind of looking, you know, are their feathers still intact? Do they have any wounds? Are they walking funny? Are they, um, no matter what you do, we do that. And all of a sudden Holly said, look at that one. And she had a, a wound the size of a 50 cent piece that had maggots in it. So we went mm -hmm. to cleaning and, you know, scoured the whole place, checked every bird again. She was the only one. Um, things will happen. Um, we have lost birds. We have, we've got a small uh, maple tree. The girls love mm -hmm. flying up to the first branch and they kind of <laughs> roost up there for a little while. One, I think, flew out. She dislocated her hip. She couldn't walk. The other girls saw that and we're going to start pecking on her. She was yeah. not going to make it. She was not. They, they will get rid of the weakest link in their flock it holds them back and brings predators in we've had to put that one down um, mm -hmm. we've had one hit by a car we've lost a couple to hawks we've had a rack uh, a fox take one out and it only took one out it never came back i'm so surprised um, yeah feral cat took one we've had a raccoon take one um it's been like one of everything and that's why we have 80. that's why we bought 40. Yeah. we're hoping that you know 35 will make it through the summer so far, we're at 40. You know, we've been good. But I'm around all yeah. the time. Um, we try to eliminate, you know, if I see them crossing the road, I'm out there bringing them back. You know, the neighbors now right. are good that they slow down. So that hopefully that threat is is okay. gone. Can you eliminate hawks? Nope. You know, uh, a hawk will just come by at the right time and you're inside or whatever if they're free ranging. Uh, are you going to lose one? Yep. You don't want to lose 20. Um mm -hmm. I haven't had one get into anything, any anything poisonous, um, any plants like that. I haven't. We, I, we think maybe one ran away. It was gone for a couple of days, came back, then we never saw it again. Did it find a boyfriend at another farm? I don't know. <laughs> we lost one that way. You know, uh, the fox came and I I saw it chasing one, and I ran after the fox and shared, scared it away, and it never came back. But it had already gotten one that day. Right. on all the feathers and stuff so can you prevent that nope unless you're outside or i build a fence can you prevent the the bird flu nope my girl's free range uh i noticed that the sparrows go over to the water or outside that i put out the sparrows go into the into the pole barn and they eat some of the food there's no way i can buy have biosecurity and you just got to do the best you can with cleanliness and watching your flock um, we had we lost one to Merrick's disease. That's something that they're they're born with. Stress brings it out. It was about the time that they go into lay that she mm -hmm. I noticed she had it. Separated her right away because that can decimate your flock. And right. when I really learned that's what she had. I mean she was contorted in such a way we put her down. Um, but I think our you know we've got seventy nine and ten. We started with a hundred. Um, mm -hmm. 10 of them, we or nine of them we sold uh, because they did nothing but be broody and want to sit. They weren't giving us eggs that we wanted. So they're down to 92. So 92 to 79, what is that, uh, 12, 13? We've yeah. lost 12 or 13 over three years through various things. Mm -hmm. um, and That's and not that, bad. No, it's not. And that's the risk of free ranging. A lot of it is, you know, if yep. I had them just in a contained coop, wouldn't have lost it to the coon the hawk, the car, the fox, but they're so much better out free ranging in my mind. I've got the space and I, I really believe in that, that we get better eggs and they're happier because they're out running around versus being 
contained in that 14 by 18 foot area. So Absolutely. I mean, my chickens have plenty of room. Um, and it's funny because right now they're on lockdown for day three because I just merged them together. So I okay. lock them down for, for three days. So everybody knows it's a safe place. So that way the new flock that got merged in there knows to come back to it. Yep. So they'll be let out tomorrow, but I can tell you right now they're going stir crazy. So you talk about diseases. Everybody talks about locking down their chickens. For me, my opinion is there's more of a chance of spreading it with them all in there because the reality of it is, is rodendia bring in all the pathogens. Yep. Whether you see them or not, they bring it in. So, and they're, you know, yep. And the mice, you know, I wish my, I still see mice in the, in the pole barn here and there. And I wish the girls were better mouse catchers, but uh, they've caught a few, but not enough. Uh, yeah, it's the rodents that'll bring it in. And being yep. confined, if you've got them in a confined area, especially if your numbers are a little higher than they should be for your space, they're going to peck on each other. There's the chance of an open wound and there's a chance of getting stuff in. And I'm just a big proponent of uh, free ranging. So I am too. I am too. I've done it a little differently because um, you talk about predators. We, we lost uh, half our flock. I was outside with them. And we had lost half our, we had one to date that we had lost. And then we had an issue with a neighbor dog who actually came in and killed half of our flock. Yeah. And, you know, sadly trying to build the flock back up has been the struggle. But one of the things you mentioned was, you know, the, the chicken that had the maggots. And I think a lot of people don't know about fly strike. And so I wanted to, I wanted to insert something here because that's something that all animals on the farm struggle with. Uh, we have Cooney Cooney pigs, and I'm not trying to change the topic, but a lot of people associate fly strike with horses, cows, sheep, that kind of thing. It affects chickens, and it affects them differently because instead of on their ears, which is, or eyes, or face, um, or even other parts of their body like larger livestock, chickens often get what we call poopy butt. And people will, uh, I know, have looked at me crazy when I've done videos on washing their butts. And the reality of it is, is I'm washing their butts to prevent fly strike. Sometimes a chicken may have a little bit of diarrhea. It gets on their fur or their feathers and it builds up over time. And that creates the perfect environment for fly strike. And what fly strike is, is the flies are biting the chicken in that area hanging around in that area. They're actually creating uh, wounds in the skin. And when they create the wound in the skin, that's when you have the maggots because they lay eggs in them. And that's exactly one of the struggles that I have with one of my Cooney Cooney pigs, which is Sherman, because they, no matter what I do, they love his ears, nobody else, but they love Sherman's ears. So his ears get cracked looking. And so I'm constantly spraying blue coat on it and then putting fly swat ointment on there. So I just wanted to throw out, uh, it's called fly swat. And it's not the label. I don't know if it says for chickens. I'm just throwing that out there, people, because it's my opinion. But I have used it on chicken butts. But keep those chicken butts clean. That's important. It's easy for that to build up the feathers. You know, the, the good fluffy feathers that are good for keeping them warm in the winter also will catch some droppings as they come out especially if it's loose and it does build up. So yeah, Holly will catch a couple birds. We'll get some warm water in a nice big basin. I've got these pink yep. gloves on and we wash some chicken butt on a warm day, then send them on their way and let them, uh, it, it, did you ever yeah. think you're going to be cleaning chicken butts, getting maggots out of a wound? You know, having chickens is so much fun, but there is, some, some downside, the dark side of it. There's some things you're going to do to help maintain your flock. And if you don't, yeah. you're not going to have a flock very long. Um, I call it responsibility. Yeah. You know, the reality of it is, is we take, we take children on because we know they're adorable, right? We have babies, they're adorable. Baby chicks are adorable. Yeah. Don't take on baby chicks if you're not prepared to deal with them being chickens and all the things that come with it. And that means you're committed to them. Yep. So don't commit unless you're prepared to fully commit. There's, and that means you got to wash a chicken butt. And, yep. you know, like you, I, I try to do it on a warm day, but 
Ryan knows when he can, we put in a utility sink for that reason in the house, okay. because we notice in the winter time, they tend to have poop stuck to their feathers because it freezes. We've noticed. Yep. And so we tend to deal with poopy butt more in the, in the winter time. And so one of the things that we have done is have a utility sink put in so that, and it's funny because Ryan and diesel, which is my dog, well, watch me come in with a chicken and they go, oh, here we go again. <laughs> but I can bring them in the house. I can I can wash them off, soak them in the utility sink. Then I can scrub the sink out with bleach when I'm done. Yep. But then I can blow dry their butts and send them back on their way. <laughs> Fluffing around. Hey, exactly. It, it but works. that's the things you do for your animals. Yep. Thank God you've got a utility sink. I do not. We've just got our, yep. our bathroom sink and our kitchen sink. Uh, if you're a newbie, don't do any of that stuff in a sink where you're going to have food prep or you're going to, yep. if they bring in salmonella and other stuff, um, do not do that in your, in your kitchen sink, please. We do it all outside uh, in the winter. Yep. If they've got some stuff stuck, I might bring, you know, grab them, hold them from behind and cut carefully just a couple yep. of feathers that are holding there and, and release it that way versus washing them. I just don't have the indoor facilities for that. Yep. Um, you're blessed. <laughs> uh, well, we we ended up having a setup for that. But one of the things that we have done in the winter before we had that sink was we ha we have a basin that's designated for that issue. Yep. Um, and so what we do is we'll fill it with warm water and I bring it in the garage. And I'll do it in there. And then again, I can still blow dry them there just because I don't want to send them off soaked. Yep. Um, you know, I towel dry them and it's not that I completely dry them, but just enough that I know that I'm not going to make the situation worse. Yeah. Um, and I, I, quite honestly, I wait a little longer in the winter because I know that there's no flies usually. Yes. Um, but I have been known to cut as well. It's just sometimes you notice that a bird does have diarrhea and it just seems to spiral yep. from they there. <laughs> they, yeah. They've been known to get into some foods that are, uh, they, they like it, but they're unsavory. So yeah, that's the best so one thing this time. Of yeah. Year. With the garden, uh, you know, our garden is absolutely overflowing. And with that, we had planted some extra tomatoes that if you're a chicken owner and you get done planting and you've got extra plants, find some space for those extra plants because that produce might be perfect for your chickens. Chickens love tomatoes. Chickens, I, I've read that that's one of the better uh, foods for them. Not, not that you want to just feed them tomatoes, but our girls are out free range and I'll do my little double whistle. They'll come over and I start throwing cherry tomatoes at them. Well, they're in heaven, you know, they're yeah. each grabbing a cherry tomato and running off. And, uh, sometimes there's a lot of cherry tomatoes or <laughs> cucumbers or, um, you know, you're skinning tomatoes for making sauce. Holly did that while well, the skins are left over and we don't really have a use for that. She made a big long line out in the in the lawn of the skins. Well, the chickens were it was like the feeding trough was open. So any treats like that, the girls love. Just no no potatoes, nothing from the nightshade family, uh, any of that. Um, yeah. So tomato plants are off limits. That's correct. something for folks to know. Um, yeah. And some potatoes. of the other nightshades are like uh, beets and peppers. Um, yep. Potatoes. Peppers change. Yep. Um, that kind of thing. So other than that, you know, squash, we keep extra pumpkins during the winter. Supposedly there might be an enzyme in there that uh, helps if they eat a pumpkin to keep worms down. It's not proven, but we'll bring a pumpkin in frozen into the pole barn, a big pumpkin. <laughs> and over a couple of weeks, they'll, the whole group will peck at it. And it's just something to keep their mind off of, Hey, it's snowing outside. We're in confined quarters, you know, a bale of hay and a big pumpkin. Well, they're happy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. We do cabbage on a metal stick. We have a, a metal rod and we'll, uh, I'll buy a cabbage and I'll put it up there and they love it. They love every minute of it. Um, yep. I'll also give them uh, marigold petals. Oh, okay. That they love and it makes their yolks rich and yellow as well. Um, so, and I know one of the things that in addition to, as we're closing now, just one of the things in addition to free ranging, which has a lot of benefits, if you're not able to free range or also good to have on hand is we do a poultry calcium. 
We also get that at Fleet Farm. Um, I find it to be a lot cheaper, yet a lot more digestible than oyster shell. Okay. It also serves the function of grit, you know, additional grit. And what I like about it is chickens know when they need it and when they don't. So I have it in a PVC pipe, PVC feeder, and they get what they need. Okay. And I just keep it filled up. And that's what I like about chickens is they're pretty self-sufficient with the exception of water and making sure there's feed in there. So yeah. I we've got kind of a very ground up uh, uh, shells, uh, uh, seashells for the calcium. Yeah. And when I go out at night to lock the barn, I'm doing a quick count. I'm also, I've got a little tiny tub and once a week or so we'll just make the circle and scatter them on the ground the girls kind nice. of just pack them up as they just a little extra calcium keep those shells strong and those little things uh, also just the supplemental stuff um, during the winter we also get what's called a flock block it's a little square one foot by one foot kind of block of uh bird seed and it, there's some fat in there that kind of stuff that they might need mm -hmm. to help throw some. And we also get uh, corn in the winter um, yep. and give them corn. Corn raises the body temperature of chickens. So you don't want to give that during the summer, but during the winter in, in our area, you know what, throw a little corn in there. Uh, we usually do it in mm -hmm. the evening. They do that as they're digesting. It's giving off heat. Another way to help keep them warm. So Ab I'm, absolutely. There's a million absolutely. Tips. Uh, if you're talking beginner chickens or chickens 101, I was at like chickens 100.5 before I started. I knew nothing. Um, <laughs> we can raise chickens. So can you. Um, Lisa's, are, you know, in either of our channels, if you've got questions, if people want to send us a note, put them down below in the comments and we'll respond. Um, but if they want to send us notes, we both had chickens for a long time. Not that we know everything. We know, right. know a lot more than I did three plus years ago. <laughs> um, but I'm still learning every day. Uh, and that's the fun of it. Ab absolutely. Every day, every day we're learning something. And, you know, I think that when we share our experiences, you know, first of all, all those experiences are learning experiences. Um, I've recently farrowed pigs for the first time and that was fun huge, to watch, <laughs> but a huge learning curve, oh, lots sure. of joy, but a huge learning curve. Uh, no matter how much you read books, uh, when you see a, a, a mama pig for the first time go after her young and you think, <gasps> um, you know, you read about it, but it's another thing to see it. And it's quite nerve wracking. So just knowing that there are other people out there going through what you're going through, yep. I think it's really important. Well, so, you had a mentor uh, helping you, mm -hmm. which is great. That's what, that's what I guess I was getting at. If people have questions, they could probably drop either of us a note. Um, mm -hmm. not that we know everything, but we might've gone through it already. Um, whether it's Merrick or a hawk or a, or a poopy butt or a maggot infested this, or uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that maybe you'll never, you know, people talk about the uh, bumblefoot and some of that, you know what? I've had a hundred chickens and <laughs> darn it. I'm, I'm going to jinx myself here. I've never had to deal yeah. with that. I've never, there's certain things that I read about. I've never dealt with them. So Maybe that's the fun to come. So, <laughs> and I think, well, I think environment is part of it because we didn't deal with it the first year at all. We had one last one case of it last year, and we had a severe case this year in oh. both feet. Um, oh. And I, we, I attribute it to the sharpness of the pine cones and oh, the pine okay. needles. So, because if there's any sharp sharp objects that are on the ground, which you're never going to be able to prevent. Right. The reality of it is, is um, a chicken gets a cut on their foot from the environment. Uh, it develops a staph infection. And the first key sign that a lot of people see is a swollen foot. They don't always limp. The one with double bumble foot was not limping. Wow. Her foot was extremely swollen. And as they free range, like you said, I walk around and I look at feet. Yeah. And when I looked at the feet, I could see that one was kind of swollen and one was like a balloon. And mm -hmm. we had to do some operating because when it comes to bumblefoot, you will have to cut the core out if it is a severe case. Um, but you can do research about that and I'll, I'll leave that for another topic. But yeah. we are at our time and I just wanted to say 
Thank you so much, so much, Rich, for being here today and for sharing your knowledge with us. Well, wow. I, I, I appreciate being asked to come on. Uh, like I said, we've learned so much over the past three plus years and uh, we love our chickens. So uh, if you're thinking of getting chickens or any animals, go for it. Just have a good plan and ask questions. So thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree more with you on that. And thank you for being here. And so I wanted to let everybody know that I am thinking of doing a Cooney Cooney Pigs 101 Homesteading Academy for myself, which would be me talking about it and my experiences, because I feel that since March of 2021, we have learned a lot about Cooney Cooney Pigs. We have raised our pigs from piglets that we purchased, and then we recently farrowed. And like I said, each experience builds on itself and you tend to learn more and more. So just wanted to uh, throw that out there. If you guys are interested, let us know in the comments down below. And also I have other folks who are lining up to come talk to us about some larger livestock. So stay tuned to the Homesteading Academy. So Rich, I'm going to let you go and I'm just going to finish up, but thanks everybody for watching. Have a Thank great you. day. Take, Take care. care.